Now that the Halloween season is over, there seems to be, that I've noticed, a jump to rush into the Christmas season and Christmas music, and I, for one, am of the stance that it is too soon for Christmas music, um, but it's not too soon for another maybe less beloved uh, Christmas staple, and that is the Christmas fruitcake. Um, mostly because I believe all fruitcakes were probably made years ago and we're still just recycling the same ones that have always existed. But I think the fruitcake gets a little bit of undue hate. I mean, sure, it looks disgusting and it smells a little funny and there's no way to determine its actual age, but I don't think that it's all bad. In fact, to me, the fruitcake is kind of the cliff bar before cliff bars were cool. It's a bunch of fruit and nuts mashed together with a tiny bit of cake Maybe a little rum or whatever holds that thing together in such a brick the way that it is. Don't really know. It's a pretty wide variety of things jammed together into a mysteriously congealed substance. And in a way, a fruitcake is a pretty good illustration for the church. And when it comes down to it, Aspen Grove Church is really just an assorted bunch of nuts and maybe a couple fruits thrown together in Christian community, mysteriously bound together by the Holy Spirit, ultimately making something I think is pretty great. And the fruitcake of the church is not just us here at Aspen Grove Church, just as pretty much every holiday fruitcake, I believe, comes from the same master fruitcake somewhere in the world. We also are part of the gigantic fruitcake of the church all over the world. As I mentioned before in my prayer, right now... All over the globe, people are gathered together to worship and lift high the name of Jesus Christ. And we are a part of that. It's something that we should take joy in, that we are a church that is joined into the global church. Think of what Paul describes in the passage that we opened our service with today. I'll read it again for you right now. He said in Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 7, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, while our major focus this morning will be on Acts chapter 15, I think this is a really helpful passage, not just to give us an understanding of how Paul thought of the church, but an understanding of how we view the church, even the church displayed in Acts 15, through this kind of a lens. It gives us sort of a thorough definition of what the church actually is. Believers like us, as the passage said, are called into something. There is a calling to which we have been called that we must live worthy of. There is this calling for us to make disciples of all nations, and we're supposed to live towards that end. This is our reason for existing as a church. And for us to exist and function together as this sort of fruitcake that we are, we'll need humility and gentleness, as the passage said. We'll need to patiently bear with one another in love, and we'll have to fight for unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So before we even continue in Acts 15 this morning, I want you to consider this idea, believers must fight for unity in the church. We must be, as it said, eager to maintain unity in the bond of peace. That's exactly what we saw play out last week when we read in the first half of chapter 15 of Acts about the Jerusalem Council. They had gathered together to contend for the faith, like we talked about, to fight for the idea <clears throat> that salvation is by grace through faith. They argued and debated, and they came out with a conclusion. And it wasn't just a local decision. It was a decision that was to go out to all believers, all who call themselves Christians. There should be unity around the decision that they contended for. They were fighting for and eager to maintain the unity of the faith. And that faith is that salvation is by grace alone. That was what they put out there to the whole church. And again, as I said, this idea is reflected in the passage from Ephesians that we just read, and it's obviously an important thing in the, in the life of the early church. They had to be eager to maintain this unity. 
Otherwise, they would be a bunch of disparate pieces of belief growing and filling in the gaps on their own, not a single congealed fruitcake like we should want to be, right? And look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1, 4 to 7 again. It said, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Believers must fight for unity. One body of the church, one spirit that empowers us and guides us, one hope of eternal life in heaven, one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith in the salvation that he has achieved for us, one baptism by his spirit into new life, one God who is sovereign over all things and enacting his will, and one unifying belief that we are saved by the gift of grace of Jesus Christ. And you can take whatever fruits and nuts and weirdos, and if they are united in these things then they are the church. Not every single church will look and act the same way. They will not be all identical, but all over the world, believers can be united on these things. So before we even get into the book of Acts today, I think we need to establish that right definition of the church based on this passage, something that we can kind of think about. I know it's kind of a, a wordy, convoluted definition, but we'll see it play out in Acts 15 together. This is our definition for the church. A unified church is made up of believers locally and globally, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission of God. Again, I know that's a big definition. It includes a lot. These are the things that we are to be united on. A unified church is made up of believers locally and globally, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the mission of God. That's who we are. That's what we are for. This massive fruitcake of all kinds of people who are saved by grace through faith, joined mysteriously together by the work of the Holy Spirit for the one purpose of the mission of God. Each faithful and unified church is a local expression of that global definition of what the church is. So like we talked about last week, you remember at the beginning of Acts 15, we were told that there were some men who had come up from Jerusalem to places like Antioch and other places along the way, and they were telling those people that you are not really saved until you become a Jew, until you practice circumcision, until you follow the law of Moses. Then you can't really be saved by the Messiah of the Jews unless you are a Jew. And this was a damaging and wrong thing for them to teach. So like we talked about, Paul and Barnabas came down from Antioch to Jerusalem to meet with a bunch of other church leaders to settle this issue. And it was discussed at length. It was argued. It was debated. And then it was settled. They decided that being saved by grace through faith was the central and essential unifying doctrine of the church. However, since they were asking Jewish believers to bend and concede on the issue of circumcision, they also had to ask the Gentile believers to bend and concede and actually kind of obey some of the Jewish cultural laws just as a courtesy to maintain that unity and community. Each side was asked to give a little bit, like we talked about last week. Now, with that matter settled, it's time to spread the word, and it's actually going to kind of rehash all that they concluded last week. Look at me at Acts chapter 15, verses 22 to 29. It says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from among us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the, th the same things by word of mouth. 
For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So again, that's kind of a rehashing of what we saw play out last week. These were the, the, this was the decision at which they arrived after much debate. The decision was made, and they send Paul and Barnabas with this letter to deliver it to the people at Antioch. And they send with them Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas as well. These are men that we've never heard of thus far in the New Testament, but Silas especially will be an important character moving forward. Now, I want you to take just a moment to notice the language of unity just in that passage that we just read. At first glance and at first reading, we might miss it, but I want you to see this is a passage about unity in the church. It begins by saying, the whole church decided these things. You could underline that at your passage if you want. The whole church together. That means the local congregation at Jerusalem, along with representatives from all of these other places, they were unified in this decision. They had all agreed together. <clears throat> Then as the letter opens, this letter written to the Gentile believers at Antioch and the other churches, it says, the brothers are writing to you, other brothers. And I want you to understand that that brotherhood language is really important. <clears throat> These people that were in Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders, had likely not met hardly any of these other believers in all these other places. This letter was basically going to strangers to them, and yet they would say, we, brothers in the faith, are talking to you, brothers in the faith. We are a family. You've never met me. We're not of the same bloodline. We don't share relatives. But we do share this one thing in common, this one faith in the one Lord who has saved us by his grace through faith. We are united in a brotherhood together. That's unity language that they wanted to get across. Later on, down in verse 25, it said that they have come to one accord. They are unified, harmonized on this decision. They describe then Paul and Barnabas as being beloved. Even that statement is a statement of unity. Remember, this letter is going to the people at Antioch. Most of those people at Antioch had come to faith because of the work in Paul and Barnabas. They associated their faith with these two leaders. And the people in Jerusalem and the other elders from, whoever, from wherever else are saying, look, we love Paul and Barnabas. They're in this with us. We, we are of one mind with your favorite leaders. And remember again what a big deal that is because it wasn't all that long ago that Paul was hated and feared by the people in Jerusalem. Remember, he was a persecutor of the church. He was the antithesis of everything that an apostle was until Jesus changed his life and changed his heart. And here the actual apostles, the original apostles, are saying, yes, he is beloved. This is, a, this is an apostle alongside us. He is a brother with us. That kind of endorsement means a lot. And then in addition to that, we saw the simple act that they sent with them, Judas and Silas, who were good leading men in the church at Jerusalem. They're basically saying, look, we're sending these representatives to you because we really like them and we think you'll like them too. They're a benefit to us. We're sending them to you almost as a gift. Enjoy these church leaders. That's another act of unity. They're saying, look, these people who we endorse are there to encourage you, to make you strong. We are in this together. So yes, the, the church is up in Antioch, and even further, as we saw on our map over the last several weeks, all the way up in Iconium and Derby and Lystra, all of those people had very little to do in their day-to-day -day lives with people in Jerusalem. And yet, this letter shows them this act of unity, that all these disparate churches in all these different places are united as one. It is a call for unity in the church, a unity that must be fought for. That's what this letter is a sign of. Now, the passage goes on to say this in verses 30 to 35. <clears throat> it says, So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. 
So you heard the letter that they sent. It was dictated for us right there earlier in the passage. You heard exactly what was written. It basically said, look, we heard some guys were giving you trouble. This is what we want you to do. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols, strangled things, things with blood in them, and try not to practice sexual immorality. Then things will go well for you. Kind of a dry, basic letter. But what does it say was the reaction when they heard this letter, when it was read publicly to the church? How did they react? What did they do? They rejoiced. They celebrated. Now, we as readers of the Bible should ask, why in the world would they be so excited about such a letter? Well, let's consider what it communicated. It was not the kind of rousing locker room speech that would really cause people to celebrate, but it was something special, and this is why. The first reason that they celebrated, as we already saw, is that it communicated this unity. It was from brothers to brothers. It showed them that they're not alone in this struggle. It helped them to understand that they were indeed part of something bigger than them as individuals, bigger than their own church just in Antioch. And it was something that was even growing further than they could ever imagine. They are a part of something huge, and that's worth celebrating. Now, secondly, back in verse 24, the leaders in Jerusalem acknowledged the problem. They identified and understood the issue of false teaching that was going on. And they said that they knew that people had come and troubled them and unsettled them. And as we talked about last week, that was a major issue for them. Imagine being a person at Antioch that's relatively new to the faith, and then somebody comes from Jerusalem saying that, no, there's actually this new rule. You can't be saved yet. You're not saved until you follow the law of Moses and get circumcised. That's a faith-breaking kind of issue, right? That's a major problem. And the people writing the letter are saying, look, we understand this is unsettling. This is messed up. We never should have allowed this to go out. We would have stopped it if we had known ahead of time. We understand your struggle. The letter shows that Christians who are far away and have no connection with them at Antioch understand and identify with their struggle. And thirdly, the letter was encouraging to them because it offered a way forward. It's saying, yes, we understand here's the problem. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to move past this. We're asking the Jews to concede on the circumcision issue. We're asking you to concede on these cultural issues for the Jews. We're asking you to bend a little bit to come together for the sake of unity. So it's presenting to them a way forward, basically saying, look, we're going to get through this. We, as this growing global body of believers, as different as we are in so many ways, we're going to work through this and find a solution. We're going to continue And that is a reason for them to rejoice. So what we see here is this. When the church fights for unity, it is encouraged and strengthened. Those words were right there in the text. The combination of the letter that was sent to them and the ministry of Judas and Silas encouraged and strengthened the believers in Antioch. It made a difference. It motivated them and readied them for whatever might come next. And as as kind of dry and almost a little bit boring as that passage is, we should understand that this is true for us as well. Think about the elements of the letter that caused them to rejoice and how it can relate to us even now. First of all, this passage and this letter ought to remind us of the bigger picture. It ought to remind us that we are a part of a faith that is not just here. So often, I think, in the Christian life, one of our biggest issues is that we can't see the forest for the trees, right? That we're so consumed with the problems that keep coming, the issues in our own lives, or sometimes the issues in our own church, the difficulties and the struggles of those things, that we kind of forget that we are a part of something that is so much bigger than this. We are a part of something that God has been doing since the time of this and much before. From eternity past, God has been working and building something And we're in it now, and even though it's hard to see because of the issues that are in front of us, we're a part of something that goes on eternally forever. God is doing something much, much bigger than whatever the problems that you're facing right now, than whatever problems are facing our church, God is doing work around the world. It is good for us to be reminded that we are a part of a large, large church in the world. Now, even just denominationally speaking, there are over 300 Baptist churches like us in Colorado that are active and doing good things, and many thousands more in the United States, and many thousands more than that across the world. We are a part of a movement of Baptist churches like ours that are doing good things. That's great. 
but even outside of the denominationality of our existence, we are a part of church as in what we've defined earlier, that there are believers around the world that may not be a part of our smaller group, but are a part of the faith in Jesus Christ that believe that they are saved by grace through faith. We are joined with them, and it is good to know that we are connected to a global movement of Christianity. Now, a second way that it applies to us, especially to me, is that I know that many of the churches in the world, even churches that I know, are going through the same struggles that we go through. As much as it feels like our problems are unique, they are not. Churches like ours, all over the place, share the same struggles. Just as the letter communicated that Jerusalem understood the problems at Antioch, we should know and be encouraged by the fact that there are other churches like us that understand our struggle. They identify with us. There is unity in the struggle with us and other churches around the world. Now, yes, there are major differences. There are divisions in doctrine and belief. So this is not a Unitarian message that I'm preaching here. I'm not saying that all churches and all religions are the same. That's not the idea. But what I am saying is that we would do well to be reminded that while we may not agree on every single point, there are many, many churches throughout the country and the world that hold with us this common belief of salvation by grace through faith. They are also empowered by the Spirit. They are also seeking to fulfill the mission of God. We are bound together in unity by the Spirit of peace with countless churches and believers playing out that faith in their local context. And that is a good thing. It is good for us to know and to take joy in the fact that God is at work in many places and in many ways. However, <clears throat> the passage brings to mind this contrast as well. On the one hand, we see this message of unity as the letter is delivered, as the matter is settled, but then we also get this contrast of continued sort of conflict. Look with me at Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. <clears throat> it says, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and who had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches." Now, you may remember, we mentioned this back when we studied Acts 13, when it mentioned Paul's departure in Pamphylia. When Paul and Barnabas originally left on their missionary journey, they went first to Cyprus and all the way through Cyprus, strengthening the church, building and making disciples. They did all this great work, and John Mark was by their side. But once they sailed north and landed in Pamphylia, Mark chose to leave them. <clears throat> Now, like we talked about before, Mark may have had really good reasons to do this. He may have had legitimate excuses for why he would depart from them in their missionary journey, but clearly, Paul still hasn't recovered from it. Now, it has been years since that happened, but Paul seems to still be holding a grudge. So after making a plan to re-step their, or retrace their steps and visit the churches that they started, Paul and Barnabas have, as it said, a sharp disagreement about this. Barnabas sees great potential in Mark. He thinks that he deserves to come along, but Paul doesn't want to deal with someone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back, so to speak. So, I imagine that this was a pretty painful disagreement between the two of them. Paul and Barnabas, remember, they had been through so much together. They were kind of a ministry dream team. They had done so much and, and made such a difference together. And now, they can't agree. And this disagreement causes them to part ways from one another, at least for a time. So one thing that I think that we see playing out here is this. As hard as it is to see in this passage is that a unified church is able to endure minor disagreements. Now, I think we should definitely note and make the distinction that this disagreement is much different than the disagreement that was addressed by the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council dealt with a doctrinal issue. 
Paul and Barnabas are disagreeing over a practical issue. So there's kind of a different category for these things. And we should understand that the church has to be able to endure these kinds of practical, more minor disagreements. It doesn't mean we concede on doctrinal things. We don't. We want to be as strong in doctrine as possible. But there will be many other disagreements that happen, and the church has to be be able to endure those things. And here is what's kind of amazing about it. As the church endures this disagreement between two of its primary leaders, even as they are pushed apart as individuals, the church is still unified. The church is still together. Yes, these two men separate and go their separate ways, but even as they are divided, the church is multiplied. In that I think we can kind of see God's hand even in this disagreement. Barnabas and Mark will go to Cyprus and to those other cities, and those people will be ministered to and strengthened and encouraged. And Paul and Silas, they will go a different way. They will go to different places and share the gospel and evangelize with new people. And in that way, the two of them separately are doing more work than the two of them would have done together. Even in their division over this issue, God is still being glorified, and the unified church is being multiplied. And fortunately, we do know from Paul's later letters in the New Testament that he continued to maintain relationships with these people, that this didn't break them. They weren't torn apart by this. Later on, he speaks very highly of Barnabas in his ministry. And later on, way later on, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, near the end of his life, as Paul sits in a prison cell in Rome, he asks for none other than Mark, who he wanted nothing to do with before, to be sent to him and describes him as very useful, which may not be the highest praise in the world, but at least it means that Mark, or that Paul saw that Mark was a good guy. He trusted him. He wanted him to be by his side even near the end of his life. So all of this shows us that as the people were unified on the idea that they're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that they're empowered by the Spirit, that they're living for the mission of God, even through minor disagreement, the church can still grow. The church can still be unified through those things. There's a great quote from a man named H.B. Charles. He says this, The message of salvation that reconciles a holy God to sinful man is also able to reconcile man to man. In other words, when we're fully invested in something that's bigger than us, we can be unified even despite disagreement. We are able to be reconciled to one another because we are reconciled to a holy God that has this great mission laid out before us. And when we are unified by the gospel as our primary defining characteristic, then all those lesser things start to lose their power. The church belongs to him. And even through disagreement, we get to be a part of that. The unified church endured this little tiff in Acts 15, and understand this, it has endured many, many other disagreements. The church has endured controversy and false teachings. It has endured countless trials and persecutions, cultural pressures, governmental demands, even the attacks of Satan himself. The church has endured, and the church has not ever even come close to being destroyed. Because a unified church is a powerful thing, and we are a part of that. So we can rejoice to be a part of this little fruitcake of Aspen Grove, a fruitcake that is connected in unity to many other fruitcakes around the world, because God is doing something amazing through His church, and His church will not be defeated. We are a local church connected in a global mission. We are joined together with believers across the world all people who believe that they are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, all who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and all who are sent out to fulfill the mission of God. We are a part of that, and it is our joy to be a part of His church. Let's pray as we finish for today. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this truth. We know that we live in a world that seeks to, be, seeks to divide people like us, There are manufactured tensions and narratives that push people away from one another. And in a world that is so divided, God, we pray that you will help us to be a church that is united. Let us not 
be tossed around by all the waves of doctrine moving us back and forth, but instead to be unified for the things that we know are true. Let the church stand even through all these storms and challenges throughout the world as one thing that has remained steadfast and true, as a mighty fortress built by God. God, help us to be that. Help us to seek and fight for that kind of unity, not just among one another here at Aspen Grove, but throughout the world with other like-minded churches who lift high the name of Jesus. We pray that you will help us to participate in your global mission alongside other believers across the world. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing as we close today.